Best ever listeners, how you doing? Welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Joe Fairless. This is the world's longest running daily real estate investing podcast. We only talk about the best advice ever. We don't get into any fluff. We've spoken to lots of successful real estate investors and entrepreneurs from Emmett Smith, Hall of Fame football player to Barbara Corcoran on Shark Tank, a whole bunch of others. And I'm pleased to say, boy, we've got a basketball stud in the house. How you doing, Tony Delk? I am doing well. Thanks for having me on, Joe. Oh, well, my pleasure. And nice to have you on the show. And obviously, best ever listeners, you know Tony Duck. But in case you're not a basketball fan, well, here you go. Here's his bio uh, in very briefly. He is a University of Kentucky grad. He was an All-American there. He is also a member of the school's Athletics Hall of Fame. He helped the team win a national title in 1996. And then he went on to have 10 successful years in the NBA. And three to four years ago, he joined the SEC, ESPN SEC Network as a basketball analyst. He also is the president of the, the Taylor Delk Sickle Cell Foundation. And he is involved in a lot of other entrepreneurial endeavors. Uh, so that being said, Tony, you want to give the best ever listeners a little bit more about your background and some of the projects you're working on right now? Uh, most definitely. Uh, from a small town, Brownsville, Tennessee, born in 1974. And to come out of that small town, I mean, it speaks volume for not only the town I come from, but from my foundation of having great parents that uh, were married for over 50 years, uh, brothers and sisters who brought me up and treated me as their own. You know, they were 15 to 20 years older than I was. So I had a, a good uh, foundation from uh, brothers and sisters, mom and dad, and just the town embraced, embraced me as a kid. And uh, growing up in that small town of Brownsville, Tennessee, I learned a lot. Having older parents that went through a lot, you know, it allowed me to be able to understand the importance of hard work. And just leaving Brownsville and going to the University of Kentucky, uh, playing there on the Coach Patino, who was probably one of my definitely top two coaches that I played for, taught me the game uh, on the mental aspect as well as the physical aspect, and he prepared me for life after basketball. So we not only went in looking at me being an 18-year-old kid, but what could I do once I finished playing basketball? And we discussed that and talked about that in length uh, when I became a senior, and he hooked me up, put me, uh, set me up with a really good business manager who's been my business manager since uh, 1996. And it's just been a lot of good things that have happened over my uh, span of not only playing basketball, but on this earth. Mm -hmm. So let's, let, let's talk about some of, some of the things you mentioned. You said that you, um, uh, when you were in the NBA or when you're at Kentucky, Rick Pitino coach, he helped prepare you mentally and physically for life, not only during basketball, but then after basketball, what are some of the, um, things that were either taught to you or that you were, um, you know, you, you experienced that helped prepare you? I think the most important thing that he taught me was not to let money define who you are as an individual and to stay humble. And that's something that having uh, older parents, but also parents that didn't require a lot, um, it kept me humble. And once I was able to make a lot of money, it didn't change who I was as, a, as an individual. I, I think there's so many layers that uh, players get away from once the money comes and the fame and the traveling, uh, being on TV. Um, it really changes who that individual is. But I always say, you know, if you have a good foundation, you keep a good circle of friends around you. So that's something else that I really that I learned from him early was that his circle of friends became our circle of friends. And mm -hmm. that's what I, didn't, I enjoyed mostly about him was that he didn't allow us to go out and meet new friends that were adults that could take us away from being who we were or give us money or give us the things that we that we needed at that time. But he made us work for it. So everything was earned. You know, he, he always made a statement that when something is given, it can be taken away. But when it's earned, it's mm. yours. So I've always taken that motto to wherever I've gone, even as I speak to kids, I always tell them, listen, the most important thing is hard work. You have to put so many hours in. And when you put those hours in, it's earned. It's not given to you because if I give you a starting position, you didn't earn it. A player can come in and beat you out at that position. And then that teaches you about life. Life is about competition. And the earlier you know that, the better you're going to be as you transition out of whatever career you're in. You're ready and prepared for what, whatever challenges uh, that will take place. 
you mentioned the circle of, fa- circle of friends and, you know, making sure we have a good circle of friends or you all, you, you had a good circle of friends. And I mean, clearly this is applicable to any entrepreneur or real estate investor. That's why I, I say we and, and us too. Right. So how do you, let's talk about uh, in your situation, how do you determine who your circle of friends that you want to surround yourself will be? Well, I, I think it's for guys that make it to the NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, hockey, whatever profession that you go into, is it's always hard to kind of figure out which friends do I take with me as I go along this journey of life. Um, I like to look at guys and consider them to be assets. You know, the liabilities are the ones that are constantly, you're going out, they never get the check, they're always <laughs> eating and mooching off you, they want free clothes, they won't, won't they want free gear, gas. They never pay for gas, so everything becomes free to them. But I like that friend that I know who's willing to get out and work because at some point in time, let's say I'm 18, I go to college, I finish, I'm 21, 22, is now my life begins. So I don't need to be taking care of other people that are not my kid. Uh, the most important thing is my friends that I grew up with from maybe five years old up until now, they're still, they're, they are still my friends to this day. And there's three guys that I talk to probably once or twice a week and nothing's ever changed. You know, we've gone on to become parents uh, and going on, going on to different careers. But what we've always kept is a great friendship mm-hmm. and they never need anything from me. So I think the friends that you consider to be uh, assets are the ones that never ask you for anything. And when they do, you know, they're going to give it back and, or they really need it. So we always establish their relationship if any of us ever made it. And, uh, you know, I was the fortunate one to make it that, you know, my line, my phone, you can always reach me. And those guys know that, you know, no matter where I play basketball, either they come and see me, they bought their tickets, they were coming to town. I said, listen, get to town, come to whatever city I'm in, I'll take care of everything else. So I just need you to at least make some commitment to find <laughs> something. And uh, that's what they've done. And, and like I said, they've been my critics, but also they've been guys that have been truthful. So when you have a circle of friends you need to have friends that hold you accountable mm-hmm. i love that yeah and you you mentioned earlier uh rick patino was number one or two on you know the coaches i think you said you learned the most from i don't want to put words in your mouth i think that's what you said who's yes. the, who's the other coach well you know what i i was i had a brief stint with uh i really enjoy scott skiles uh, when I left Sacramento, I was in a great situation playing with the Kings, playing with the likes of Vladi Diva, Pedro Stojakovic, uh, Chris Weber. We had a really good team, and I enjoyed just playing with those guys. It was a family. It took me back to Kentucky, uh, just how we played together. And what made Coach Patino so special was I spent four years with him, so he got to know mm-hmm. me in and out. Uh, the other coach was Scott Skiles. I only got about a year and a half with Scott Skiles, but – he believed in the hard work. He was a role player like myself, but he allowed me and gave me the opportunity to go out there and play the game that I was capable of playing uh, and probably should have been playing if I was with the right coach. He allowed me to be a role player. He wanted me to, to be a scorer, uh, to play with freedom, to play hard on defense. So of all my coaches outside of Coach Patino, and I, and I played for a lot of really good coaches, but uh, Scott Skiles, when I left my when I left with this situation, in Sacramento, it was going to have to be a better situation for a coach that understood my game and allowed me to play my game. Let's let's talk about your game. Uh, what would you say, as a basketball player, would be the best part of your basketball game? And I, I, I'm I'm headed to a. Uh, there's going to be a couple follow up questions, so I'm <laughs> I'm not just curious. I, I have a, a purpose for this. Uh, I think the gift I've had that I had early, uh, even going back to middle school, was that I could always score the ball. Like that was a knack and that was something that I love to do. And I did it well throughout my career. And the NBA was different because I was traded a lot and I really didn't get a chance to showcase everything I could do offensively. But also you go into a situation where there are franchise players and those players are paid a lot more money than I was getting paid. So, you know, they – the, uh, the system, um, they, sell the, they sell the seats, sell mm-hmm. tickets, you know, so the fans come and watch. And I understood that. So I understood my role. Like, I wasn't the guy that knew when I come, when I came in, oh, you know what, I want to be the star player. If it happened, 
it presented itself, I would have been more than willing to take on that challenge. But every position I was put in, I consider myself a role player. But when I was set out there to be a starter, I can trigger on both ends of the court. And that's something that Coach Patino really brought me was the uh, was a defensive side of basketball. Mm -hmm. He knew I was a prolific scorer in high school, but he always told me, like, listen, if you're going to have a career, you got to be able to play both sides of the ball. So he allowed me to play offense, but he really pressured me to play defense. And that, that leads into my follow-up question. Uh, knowing that uh, – you said since middle school, you've always been a scorer. Uh, do you, would you focus, would you be best in the NBA if you focus more on your scoring or more on the areas like defense or whatever that you're not as naturally good at? I think when I came into the league, it was more of, um, you know, when I got drafted by Charlotte Hornets, it was more to be a point guard. So, that part of my game, I had not, had not developed the way I needed it to. It, it came, came the latter part of my career that I became a better, better distributor, someone that could play off the pick and roll, someone who could play um, with the ball in my hand, make it play, being a facilitator to my teammates. But I think early on, and even going through high school, I always played with the ball in my hand. So that was a, that was a, a, um, a transition that was hard even going to Kentucky my first year playing with Jamal Mashburn, who everything went through him. Mm -hmm. And as a freshman, I didn't play much. So the first thing I was thinking about was, hey, you know what? I need the ball in my hand to be successful. The ball, I'm not touching the ball. Jamal Mashburn is getting all the touches. Travis Ford is getting all the touches. Here I'm as his freshman. And you're watching, I'm watching my peers play. I'm like, wow, you know, my game can't be that far off. But also going back to Coach Patino, he taught me how to play without the ball. So teach me how to play with uh, coming in as a scorer, but also teach me how to play without the ball in my hand to be effective using screens, being able to come off the pick and roll, stagger screens. And then once I got to the NBA, my first season with Charlotte Hornets, they wanted me to be the point guard again. And once again, I went for a four-year stretch of being a shooting guard, a scorer. And now I have to get the ball to Vlade Divac, uh, Glenn Rice, Dale Curry. Anthony Mason, and it just wasn't – I just wasn't as comfortable as I was the latter part of my career. So that was a, me going – me figuring out how to play that position. But when I left Sacramento to go play with Phoenix, I got a chance to watch Jason Kidd, who I thought was uh, the best point guard I ever played with. And so now that you're, you're retired from the NBA and you're an entrepreneur, you know, businessman – what what would where do you put your focus in terms of um because there's there's a lot of skill sets that are required to right. be an entrepreneur and to be successful in business and so do you take the approach of focusing on what you're naturally good at and right. then not focusing as much on the the weaknesses or do you want to try and work on all the things and you don't go all in on your special skill set well, I think you work on all, all the aspects of becoming a good businessman. And I think the most important thing was one of my partners. I'm the CEO of a company called v and which is Viola and D. It was named after my partner's grandparents. And he started the company in 1995. And uh, what he started out doing was fabricating. And when he, when he brought myself in and, and a really good friend, he wanted us to come in and learn the business from his side and, and kind of see how it worked. You know, he told me that he said the best advice I can give you, you don't need to know the business. You, you need to know how the business runs. So that's what I've been focused on with this, with uh, my business venture with Lawrence Butler and Kendall Dancy. Uh, and what we're doing is we're a minority company. We supply material to different projects, you know, with rebar, steel, iron. So I'm learning um, what he knows and just getting the knowledge from him. And he's been a good mentor, uh, a good business partner because he's bringing me along slowly and he always says it's better to hit a bunch of home run a bunch of singles mm -hmm. doubles and triples and not always try to bet for the home run so we're it's a process that, that we are that we've been going through uh, but it's been fun just to learn how corporate america works and just him being a, a uh, successful businessman for over 20 years you know he's someone i can pick up the phone at any point in time and call and what he is he's an honest person and um, I know he's been successful in his business. So 
uh, when you in, when you become an entrepreneur, you want to make sure, like I said earlier, surround yourself with good people. Uh, you're not going to know everything about the business. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why if you look at the ownership of teams, you know, you have a president, a GM, assistant GM. Mm-hmm. There's positions that guys are in, and you have to know your role. So when he put me as the CEO, he's like, Tony, I need you. I don't need you to get deep in the, deep in the weeds. He said, you know, so make sure before that happens, you know, we have the discussion as well as the discussion with uh, all the partners uh, in this business venture. Mm-hmm. When we, you when you talk about you know the the different kind of lessons that you've learned so far um, in both business and then also M- the MBA and in college and with coaches, it it makes me wonder while you were in the MBA, um, I suspect you were preparing for life after the MBA. So what were you doing? And I'm asking this question for all the best ever listeners who have a full-time job right now and they want to either transition out of it or they're looking for retirement. So how did you prepare for life after your current occupation or your occupation in the MBA? It's it's always difficult. Um, you know, and I can go back to when I first signed with my financial guy, uh, Rick Avar, and he had this 15 to 20 year plan with my money. I'm just, I'm thinking to myself, I'm 21, 22. <laughs> I'm going to play basketball forever. How can yeah. I not play this game for the next 20, 30 years? So at that age, you know, you're not really thinking about, um, you know, 35, 40, 45, 50, because you're so young, you have a different mentality. And uh, going back to my parents, we didn't, you know, we grew up, we grew up poor you know, my, we, we didn't have money. So my parents really couldn't prepare me for being, um, being in a position to uh, handle a lot of money or to be, mil- be in the middle class and kind of see how uh, the workforce worked, how corporate America worked, how investment worked. So all of that was learned on the fly for me. And Rick Avar, who was a really good mentor, friend, financial guy, he was teaching me along the way about investing in something that's going to last 15, 20 years. And not only that, but when you get done playing basketball, because it's going to end for everyone. I think that's the, that's the million dollar question is no matter how good you are from Michael Jordan to will be LeBron at some point in time, Kevin Durant, it is for all of us. What's the next transition that you can uh, get into that's important for you, but also gives you time to enjoy life because you've been made a lot of money. We have, uh, as players, we have devoted a lot of time to this particular sport. I mean, as much as we love it, you know, to get really good at something, you really have to devote a lot of time, sacrifice time where you might want to go out and hang out with the boys, the fellas, um, you know, take trips, but you're working on your craft. So when it gets to the end, not even to the end, I knew at about 28 that in about five years, I'm going to be, I, I will be finished playing basketball because my body was taking a beat. But also I knew, you know what, I gave 15, 20, 25 years to this sport from starting at five years old and I'm getting tired of it. So I wanted to transition to something else. Mm -hmm. As far as your time goes for the amount of hours you work now, is it more or less than when you're in the NBA? Oh, a lot less. I mean, you have to work smart. I mean, you don't, you don't keep working those same hours and, uh, you know, how many you work in, how many do work, do you work in the NBA? Oh, NBA, man, I would say during a week of counting games, probably about 30 to 40, maybe 30. 40 to 50. Because I, I, was, I was a player, I loved, I loved being in the gym. So in the summertime, season done, I'm play 82 games. We've gone to the playoff, and all of a sudden, you know, I take a week off, and I'm back playing basketball. And I, I guess it was a love for the game, and if I could have maybe done it all over again, I would have rested my body. I would have maybe taken up golf, golf as a hobby. I would have done something else to reserve these legs because even as I go out and play now, the next day is when it's when it's the most painful. But when you get toward, towards the end of your career, and as I went out and watched some of the guys um, in the summer league, some of the guys who were veterans, what I saw from those guys is more maintenance, shooting, ball handling, just the, the, the fine points of the game and not the physical contact, but – I needed the physical contact to solidify me being uh, just being on the court, you know, just being involved with the game. Uh, it was easy to go through drills and shoot and make shots. But, I mean, I want to have the contact. And that's what, when we finish, to get towards the end, 
you miss the competitiveness, but also you miss the contact of playing and going against guys. Based on your experience as a, you know, achieving at a high level in your, in your profession, as well as entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur and businessman, what is your best advice ever for real estate investors based on your experience? I would say make sure when you when you're investing, make sure you can drive to your investment. You know, and that's something I was taught early is that you know you can become a millionaire just in your state, your city alone. You gotta find the, the right land. You have to do your research. And once you do your research, you get with a realtor and you have a vision. And that vision has to be 10 or 15 years. But even when I was taught early with my investments, the first thing someone told me was like, if you make an investment. Make sure you can drive and see how that, see how it's operating on the day to day. Because you can put your money into something, and before you know it, you know you will be involved with another project. But to see a project grow uh, from from start to finish, and potentially someday sell that project, that's the goal of of myself now. As I get involved into different investments, I want equity in the company. You know, just in case that company sells for let's say fifty, hundred, two hundred million. I want to have a percentage of it so I can say, hey, you know what? I benefited from putting my own money in, but also looking at an investment that could bring my family, my kids, maybe my grandkids. Like, I have to look further than just where I'm at right now. You know, I want to think about how can I create gener generational wealth for my family, being in the position that I'm in. And it all starts with the opportunity and knowing the right people and timing mm -hmm. and timing. Mm hmm last question on this front that I want to ask you about a challenge, a challenging time, any challenging time you've come across, but on the right people part, uh, you mentioned the assets and liabilities, which as real estate investors resonate with us very well. Uh -huh. uh, we totally, we totally get that. Is there anything else other than, um, that, that helps you screen team members out? Because I suspect now it's a different, it's an evolution of, how you select which opportunities because clear I think people are going to attempt to show you that they will be an asset and they won't mooch off of you whether or not that's true or not who knows <laughs> but but how, how do you screen that out now that you're you know at, at a different level well you know what the level it's the age it's the age factor mm -hmm. um a loss at 20 is totally different from a loss at 40 you can recover a lot, a lot, you know, you still can, a loss is a loss, but at 20, I have time to recover. But at 40, you you basically have accumulated everything leading up to this point and all of your money or whatever you have, your investments, you know, you have built that over time. So to go out and invest with someone with your life saving, you're 43, you about to go, uh, you see something that's going to be profitable somewhere down the road and say, hey, I'm excited about this, about this adventure, this project, I'm going to put all my money in. You want to think about it because it's not only about you right now. It's about your family. It's about your kids. It's about maybe their kids. It's like putting your family in a bad situation because you're excited about an investment. So it, once again, it's the research. It's talking to the people, seeing have they gone bankrupt? Uh, what have they done? Have they been successful over time? And where are they at to this day? And when you're 20, I was excited about anything. I was like, hey, you know, friends came with different watch. Uh, car wash, restaurants, I mean, all these great ideas. But guess what? No one came with the elephant in the room, the money. So I was a money man. So you would take a, a, a an investment at 20 because, you know what, you really don't know a whole lot about it. You know, it sounds good. Helping a friend out. Let me do this. You know, if I make money, uh, you know, great. If I don't, you know, not a big deal. Maybe I won't have to deal with that friend anymore because <laughs> he owes me, he, he, owes me he's the, uh, he owes me debt now. But as I've gotten older, I take my time. It's a uh, phone call, uh, research and talking to people. Um, you know, so I take my, it, it's, it's more about understanding you have the opportunity. There's gonna, always going to be opportunities out there, but which opportunity is the best for you at that time? And I always say, do something that you like or you love. Mm -hmm. uh, if you love it, that means you're going to be all in. You, you're going to want to see that project grow. And that's kind of how, how I see my projects now. If I'm going to be involved with it, I want to be there to the day-to-day, -day, but also I want to talk to the people who run in the company. And as I said earlier, I want to be able to drive to the project and just maybe pop up on some people and, and mm -hmm. not let them know I'm coming. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you the opposite question here in a little bit, but what's the, what's the most 
ridiculous investment that you've made. I mean, you mentioned car wash where people don't have the money and you find it like, what, what's an investment gone wrong for yeah. you? You know what? The, the, first, the first investment went wrong was me giving my brother, I think I gave my brother like maybe 15, 20,000 somewhere. And it was my first year in the league. So, you know, my brother was a catalyst behind me, make it to the NBA. He worked with me. We was out, out back uh, in the backyard practicing, rebounding. But I was like, you know what? My brother got a good idea. I want to see my brother make money. <laughs> And this money, so I gave it to him. I made him sign, you know, sign a uh, sign a loan over, you know, like, hey, this is what I'm gonna pay you back and such and such, which I pretty much knew I wasn't giving my money back. <laughs> but he had this, he had this bright idea about the car alarms. You know, it's like, hey, you know what, this car alarm, if people walk by, they touch your car, you know, this alarm is gonna go off. It's, it's it was a system that he came up with in 90, it was 1996. And I'm thinking to myself, like, they already out. I don't know, know people have them. But you know what? I didn't want to. I didn't want to kill my brother's dream. So, gave him the money. Long story short, uh, a few months down the road, you know, I knew I wouldn't get my money, and he never said anything about those alarms again. So I knew it was a. It was a failed. It, it was a failed investment uh, by him. But it was basically me giving him some money for kind of being a mentor, a brother, and helping me out along the way. So, That's absolutely. And what a, in, relatively speaking, in, inexpensive lesson if that's, <laughs> if, if you learned it there and not on something much larger later exactly. down the road. Exactly. Yeah. You, so you, you should actually thank him and maybe give him 15K more just because <laughs> he saved you money in the long oh, run. You know what? To be honest with you, really he did because after that, I, I knew then I, would, I wasn't going to invest with family and friends mm -hmm. anymore. So you're right. Instead of him, and like I said, it was a valuable lesson learned. But also, I think when you have family and friends and you see them struggling, even they come, come up with good ideas, you know, the, the good in me, I want to help people, you know, because even if it turns out bad, you know, I'm still going to have a smile saying, you know what, my higher power control wasn't in control of what I, what I did, who I gave it to, but he was happy with me giving it freely. Mm hmm Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great story. Thank you for that. Okay. So most challenging time. What's a what's a challenging time you've come across? Because everything's not always rosy, right? No, it's not. It's not. I, I think I, I would have to go back 10 years when I was at the end of my career. Matter of fact, I was playing overseas uh, in Greece and that was my last professional year. And I'll never forget uh, you know, getting a phone call from my niece and she called me and she, she told me my mom had gotten really sick. And at that time, I didn't know to what degree uh, that she was sick. And she said, you know what, you have to come on now. So at time, so I'm leaving Greece. I have to fly back to New York, drive uh, from New York to Memphis, drive from Memphis to a hospital that's about an hour and a half from Memphis, and just really come into my mother's deathbed. And i never forget just walking in and just seeing her just waiting on me because I was the, the last of her eight kids. So she basically... Um, stayed around and she was like, listen, I had to wait to see my baby, you know, so I was, you know, it, it was probably the most trying time of my life just to come in and be on my mother's deathbed, but just to know that she was holding on uh, to wait for me to get there, you know, it just let me know the sacrifice, the love, um, the commitment, and when you have a, a strong mother like that, you know, and to see her in that position, you know, I would tell anyone, you know, until you've lost a parent, you don't know the devastation of losing a mom and just the connection that we had because I, I would talk to my mom pretty much every day you know as i as i got older I, I i became closer to her because i knew she was aging uh but you know when you become an adult you know there's some things you want to pop off your parents or call them and get some advice on and you know she never told me anything wrong you know so i always i love that woman from the uh, from the day I was born until the day she passed. So, you know, that was tough. And also I was going through going through a divorce at the time. I didn't know if I was going to finish basketball. My third child was born. So 2007 was a trying time for me. But God was with me throughout the uh, throughout that whole ordeal. And, um, you know, but it started with my mom just giving me that, that foundation of uh, believing in a higher power and, and just believing that God is going to get you through anything. Is, is, is faith the kind of the, the main thing that helps you, helped you and continues to help you through that? I mean, in the try, trying times? I mean, it, it's not even close um, how much I believe in God and just the importance of ha having a higher power that you can look up to, that you can pray to at night, that you can talk to when you need someone to speak to. Um, and that started with my mom. You know, I can remember coming home from college and 
you know, that Saturday night, you might go out and have fun, but Sunday morning, you got to get up and go to church. You know, there is no, oh, you want to sleep in at 10, 11. You know, when you came in that house at whatever time, Saturday or uh, early Sunday morning, you know, when it was time to go to church, you know, mom, mom came and knocked on the door, woke me up. I need you to go to church. So, you know, I, I think the having the foundation early in life um, and keeping me humble, but it started with just how much she believed in God and just her commitment to to our, the, uh, the church we went to. And then, she, you know, she would go every Sunday and she was really, she was a strong believer. So that, uh, as I look back, you know, when I was growing up, you know, I didn't think about it at the time because you're so young and, you, you know, you only thinking about, wow, I, mean, I have to go to church and you're only giving two hours to God, you know, on that Sunday. And so you have to think about how much more time that, you know, that needs to, to be committed or to be loyal to someone who is going to watch out for your every need and take care of your every need. Excuse me. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. All right. We're, we're going to do a lightning round. You ready for the best ever lightning round? Let's make it happen. Let's All do right. it. All right, Tony, I, I have got some questions from best ever listeners who have um, some questions for you and you don't have, you don't have to be like rapid fire answers. Right. Um, but I just, just uh, so here, here we go. Uh, you, I believe you went to, you were with seven NBA teams, right? In 10 years. Okay. Pro one pro and one con for being with seven NBA teams in 10 years. You get a chance to visit a lot of different cities that when you move, it doesn't cost you anything to move. And uh, for me, it's just seeing all different parts of the country for free. Mm -hmm. Okay. Con? Um, new teammates. New teammates, new system, um, new players. You know, you have to get acclimated with the city. So I, I think that's what, you know, as I move, you know, I would always think about where am I going next? You know, after one year, what's the next destination? You know, what city will I be in? What team will I play? But I tell you the good thing about it, but well, some of these equipment guys are still with these teams. So whenever I pick up the phone, I can call them and I can get free gear. <laughs> <laughs> Speak, speaking of cities. That's a benefit. <laughs> what's the best ever NBA city to visit and why? Ooh, you know what? That, that's a tough one, but I, I would have to – gotta put Miami I mean you gotta yeah. love Miami just yep. the, the scenery the weather uh just being able to get out on the beach if you need to the nightlife is is, is glorious um <laughs> you know I, I love warm weather you know and my and my second favorite city would have to be uh Phoenix I, I love Phoenix Phoenix is a place that when I left Sacramento it was going to Phoenix a place where I always wanted to live I, I love the desert I um uh, I like the uh, the atmosphere, and you know it was a new look for me coming from the south to see seeing all the green. Now you get to see the cactus, the the desert, uh, the stucco homes. Uh, so I enjoy being in Phoenix, and uh, the city uh, that most most players love to go to, Miami. <laughs> What's the? You might remotely strangle me when I ask you this question. Best ever SEC to root to root for, not named Kentucky. Woo! <laughs> That, that's tough, but, but I'm going to tell you, the reason why I would say at that time, Florida Gators would be Billy Donovan. Billy Donovan was the guy that started recruiting me as a sophomore out of Haywood High School in Brownsville, Tennessee. So if it wasn't for Billy Donovan, I never would have gone to Kentucky. So I have to say Florida Gators, he was the one that, uh, that got me to commit to Kentucky. He was a uh, he was a brother to me when I wasn't playing, and he was also a mentor, a friend, and someone who I knew was going to be a great coach uh, because of his work ethic and his love for the game of basketball. So it would have to be the Florida Gators. Best ever SEC town to visit? Ooh, I would have to say, hmm, I like Nashville. I, I think Nashville, even to this day, with them bringing professional teams there, has always been a city that's that's grown over the over years. Um, they have great restaurants, and plus it's my home state. So I have to go with my home state. I would say Nashville. Most challenging part of being an NBA or a, a bas basketball analyst? You know what? Not not being so biased when it comes to Kentucky. That's <laughs> the toughest thing <laughs> because you want to see your alma mater do well, but also you have to speak the truth when the truth needs to be spoken. And Big Blue Nation don't always 
accept the truth when it comes to Kentucky. So that <laughs> I think that's the hardest thing for me is just trying to the, the balance between being an analyst and also being a Kentucky fan. So I have to, <laughs> I have to balance those two out when I'm uh, when I'm in the studio. Best ever investment you've made so far. Woo! Best investment I ever made. I think Papa John's Pizza. It, it's done well for me for about 15 years now and counting. And at the time, um, I really wasn't a big Papa John's fan. You know, once again, as I say, might not like the pizza. Just got to know how the business run. And if it makes you money, just uh, let it make money the way it's doing. And whether you eat the pizza or not, you know, who cares? But uh, that was a great investment that I made uh, early in my career. And I'm still benefiting off of that to this day. What's the best ever project you're working on right now? You know what? I have I actually have two projects I'm working on. Um, one with my girlfriend Nicole. We're looking into uh, looking into the wine. We hadn't totally committed yet. It's, it's the uh, the wine industry, and we're, I'm doing my research now. But I'm very very interested in in the uh, the potential that it has uh, with my name behind it, but also just being able to to brand it to uh, uh, brand it in the southeast. So I'm excited about that opportunity. Um, that's that's ahead of me. The IMAC uh, Regeneration Center that we probably be opening sometime uh, next year in Lexington, Kentucky, with my name behind it. Another project that I'm, I'm uh, extremely excited about, um, you know, as it helps out, you know, just the the uh, middle class, older generation um, with stem cell, uh, platelet rich plasma, chiropractic, um, just PT. So there's so many different things that's under one roof with the IMAC Regeneration Center that, you know, it really excites me. I got a chance uh, just last week to go to the Ozzy Smith um, IMAC Regeneration Center in St. Louis and then the David Price uh, Regeneration Center in Nashville. So just seeing how those two projects are working uh, from the employees to the owner, um, uh, the founder, Matt Wallace, you know, just having great conversations over the last week, you know, with, with good people. Uh, meeting their families, and that's what you have to do when you uh, get yourself involved in projects. Get to know the people, um, family, friends. You know, you need to talk mm -hmm. to those people because I want to be connected uh, not only because of the money, but I like to know that it's family oriented and it's something that's going to benefit all all people involved. So you have to take don't take care of your employees; they don't take care of your clients. Mm -hmm. Great business advice, that's for sure. Well. Tony, how can the best ever listeners either, you know, learn more about what you got going on or follow what you're doing? What's the best way to, where, where can we send them? Uh, Twitter, TLW00. That's where you're going to find me at. I'm on Twitter. Uh, and I do tweet back occasionally. <laughs> I, I love, I love to retweet, but, uh, <laughs> you know, if I see a good quote, I'm definitely going to retweet it. But I think if this year goes along, I'm, I'm planning on doing a lot more uh, tweeting and, uh, maybe shoot some videos and be training kids, uh, being a mentor. Um, and I think that's, you know, I want to have some footage uh, and give give the, uh, give the my Twitter follow, followers some content that's and right. what I'm doing, you know, and let them know that I'm still still relevant. I still love the game of basketball. I love teaching it. Uh, I'm trying to be the best entrepreneur that I can possibly be for the year 2017 going into the future. Well, Lots of life lessons that you shared with us. Thank you. I'm very grateful. I know the best ever listeners are really grateful for you spending some time Yo, with my us. And, pleasure, man. Thanks for yeah. having me. Maybe we can do this again down the road. Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, a couple things that really stood out to me. One is just the foundation that you come from. You know, you mentioned your parents have been married or were married for over 50 years and, you know, how you have, um, you, you go, you've gone through like, most people challenging times you shared a couple i'm sure there are many others that yes, are. You know, we didn't have we didn't have time to share but have, having the foundation and then um how as your career has evolved and you've made more money how you've had to identify the right people to bring with you and i love the assets and liabilities it's it's so um just just so straightforward um just assets liabilities um are they adding to val are they adding value to the relationship and yeah, relationship it's also with the you? Same in dating too. So don't forget yeah, that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> same model whenever you're dating, trying to find that 
that wife to be is that asset liability. That's true. That's that's true. And uh, there's a pun there, but I'll leave that alone. Um, <laughs> and and then with the best, you know, advice that that you've got you know, in terms of running businesses, know how the business runs. You don't need to know all aspects of it, but no. know how the business runs. And I love the philosophy of if something is given to you, it can be taken away. If it's earned, it's yours. So thanks for being on the show. Hope you have a best wow. ever day. Hey, we'll Thank talk you. to you soon. Appreciate it. All right.